Dr. Williams is the Florence and Laura Norman Professor of Public Health at the Harvard T.H. Chan Ching School of Public Health and Professor of African and African American Studies and Sociology at Harvard University. He, he served six years on the faculty uh, at Yale University and 14 at the University of Michigan. He holds an MPH from Mona Linda University and a PhD in Sociology from the University of Michigan. Dr. Williams is an internationally recognized authority on the social influences of health. He has been invited to keynote scientific conferences all over the world, and he's here with us today at Westchester. He's the author of more than 400 scientific papers. His research has enhanced our understanding of the complex ways in which social economic status, race, stress, racism, health behaviors, and religion uh, impacts uh, health. The everyday discrimination scale that he developed is one of the most widely used measures of just of discrimination in health studies. He has received numerous awards and honors and was ranked as one of the top 10 most cited social scientists in the world in 2005 and as the most cited black scholars in the social, in the social sciences in 2008. In, two, in 2014, uh, Thomas Ruders rated him as one of the world's most influential scientific minds. These are just a few of the things that he has accomplished. So it's an honor for me to um, welcome Dr. Williams to our university and present him to you today. So welcome. Mm -hmm. It's really good to be here with you and to think and talk to you about the challenges we face in the United States in terms of social inequalities, um, but also think about what the opportunities are that exist um, in terms of addressing the underlying challenges. I have a lot of territory to cover, so I'm just going to jump right in so that we have some time left for conversation and discussion of questions that you might have. So, what are the ma major health challenges we face in the United States? Probably the single biggest challenge that I would begin with is that the United States is not the healthiest nation on the planet. What is surprising about that and, and really stunning about that is according to the World Bank, half of the money spent on medical care in the world annually is spent in the United States. We are less than 6% of the world's population, consume one half of its medical resources, and rank near the bottom of the industrialized world on health, and are losing ground over time. So in 1980, we ranked 11th in the world on life expectancy. In 2014, we ranked 35th. 34 other countries have better health, even measured by the length of life, than the US. We rank behind countries like South Korea, Greece, Cyprus, Cuba, and Lebanon are all countries where the overall health is better than in the United States. And I'll talk about inequalities in health by race and ethnicity. It's not just that the minorities are doing badly. If white America were a country in 2014, it would rank 34th in the world of life expectancy. If black America were a country, it would rank 96th in the world of life expectancy. 
So the first big point I want to make, these are the actual data, but I'm not sure you need to look at the gruesome details. I gave you the big picture. The first big point that I think we want to begin with is that all Americans are far less healthy than we could or should be. So while I've been spending a lot of time talking about gaps in health for various groups, we need to begin with a clear understanding that all of us could be doing better in terms of health. And then there are large gaps in health by socioeconomic status. Uh, I use the term socioeconomic status to capture variations in health by income, education, occupational status, or wealth. I'm trained as a sociologist, and as a sociologist I learned that socioeconomic status is a powerful predictor of virtually any desirable resource in society. So I'll give you one example that is not as far removed from health as you might think it is, um, is the SAT scores the Scholastic Aptitude Test, which some are calling the Student Affluence Test. Why? Because of the strong graded relationship between SAT scores and family income. This is national data for the United States in 2014, uh, data from the College Board, and you can see as family income increases in the United States from $20,000 a year or less, all the way up to $200,000 a year or more, there is a graded straight line relationship with every higher level of family income predicting higher SAT scores. That should raise profound questions for us as to how we use the test, how we interpret them, what we think they capture, since they so powerfully reflect the available resources that households have. Well, what's true for the SAT test is also true for health in the United States. This is national data for the United States, Looking at the relative risk of overall mortality by family income, from incomes of $25,000 or less in this study to incomes of more than $115,000. And using this group as the standard of comparison, you could see that low income American households have an overall death rate that is three times higher than that of higher income households. And it's not just that it's a threshold effect where the poor are doing badly, but every higher level of household income is associated with lower risk of death. What is true for overall mortality is true for a broad range of conditions, virtually, virtually in their couple exceptions, but virtually every health outcome is patterned this way. And it's patterned this way not just in the United States, but it's patterned this way globally. Socioeconomic status is the largest predictor of variations in health in the world. It's more powerful than cigarette smoking. It's more powerful than carcinogens. Tell me about someone's socioeconomic status. I can tell you a lot about their health. The WHO uh, talks about why socioeconomic status um, matters so profoundly. And basically, they argue that your income, education, occupational status determines your opportunities to be healthy from the cradle to the grave. It determines the quality of life in early childhood and the quality of education and preparation for employment or higher education and the quality of employment opportunities and the quality of jobs that you have and the quality of housing and neighborhood environments and the quality of life and retirement. So vir virtually from the cradle to the grave, socioeconomic status is a powerful predictor of health. One pattern of health in the United States that has received a lot of attention recently is the worsening health status of low socioeconomic status whites. Um, Case and Deaton, two economists, uh, published a paper in 2015 that documented if you look at 1999 to 2013 and you look at middle aged Americans, that while mortality overall was declining for African Americans and declining for Hispanics, it was actually overall increasing. Uh, for uh, middle-aged whites. And as they dug more deeper into the pattern, what they discovered is that the pattern of increasing mortality was not true for all middle-aged whites. It was only true for middle-aged whites with a high school education or less. For middle-aged whites with a college degree or more education, their health was continuing to improve. So we can talk a bit of overall mortality, or it's often talked in the media about decline in life expectancy. It's the same thing as the flip side of the coin. Uh, these researchers, as they were struck by that pattern, asked another question. What exactly is it? Which are the specific causes of death that are increasing for these groups? 
and they identified that there were three causes of death that completely accounted for this pattern. First is opioid over overdose, the poisoning category here. Second is suicide. And third is chronic liver disease linked to alcohol abuse. So basically what they're finding is that uh, looking at national health interview survey, that this group of people have high levels of depressive symptoms, high levels of psychological distress, and high levels of hopelessness, which manifests itself in opioid overdose liver cirrhosis from alcohol abuse, and suicide. So that's another pattern of, of America's health that we'll come back to, that we need to think to address. I think it's important to keep in mind, though, because there's a lot of misunderstanding of this, even in, in the media coverage of it, that although the trend overall for these, this group, not Hispanic whites, is slight, is going up, and for blacks and Latinos, it's going down, that overall, African Americans still have markedly higher death rates than the white population, although the trends are going uh, in different categories. So we've talked about socioeconomic status. Overall, socioeconomic status uh, for a specific uh, subgroup in the United States. These data would help us to predict that there would be large racial ethnic differences in health, simply because socioeconomic status is very strongly patterned by race and ethnicity in the United States. To give you an example of how strong this pattern is, here is national data for the United States um, from a 2016 report from the United States Census Bureau, so this is 2015 annual income. And I've just translated the income data in a way in which you just can't possibly miss the point. For every dollar of household income white households receive, Asian households receive a dollar and 23 cents. Um, Asian households are a group that is heavily made up of immigrants. 70% of all Asians in the United States are immigrants. Asians are the most highly educated group in the United States. They have come to the United States, highly skilled subgroups from their countries of origin with high levels of education. For example, many Asian groups, about 70% of Asian immigrants have a college degree or more education. That's true only of 31% of whites in the United States over age 25. So it's, it's a very highly educated group. And so the, the fact that they have higher income is not surprising, especially if we also consider that this is total household income and Asian households have more persons contributing to household income than any other racial group in the United States. At the same time, if you look at the historically disadvantaged groups, for every dollar of income white households have, Latino households have 72 cents, Native American households have 62 cents, and African American households have 59 cents. What is striking about a 59 cents figure is that's identical to the racial gap in income in 1978. You heard me right. In 1978, black households earned 59 cents for every dollar that white households earned. And I picked 1978 as a comparison point because 1978 reflects the peak point of the gains from the civil rights policies of the 1960s and the anti-poverty policies of the 1960s. Throughout the decade of the 80s, for example, blacks have fallen from this 59 cents level to as low as 55 cents in the mid-1980s. Um, my point, though, is this degree of of racial inequality in income is much larger than most of my students think. Most of my students think that we've made a lot more progress than that in the United States. Importantly, data on racial differences in income dramatically understates the degree of racial inequality in economic circumstances. What do I mean by that? Income captures the flow of resources into the households. It tells us nothing about the economic reserves that households have to cushion shortfalls of income. That's wealth, that's looking at assets. And if you look at the latest national data on wealth, for every dollar of wealth that white households have, black households have six pennies and Latino households have seven pennies. The racial gap in wealth today from this most recent report is larger than it was when President Obama took office. Because during the economic downturn and the housing crisis, um, blacks and Latinos disproportionately lost home equity and home ownership. And home equity is the single biggest source of wealth in the typical American households. So not surprisingly then, there are large racial ethnic disparities in health. There are two patterns that are evident if you look at health in the United States. Pattern number one is racial groups that have been in the United States for a long time 
um, and that have been historically stigmatized and exploited, uh, geographically isolated African Americans or Blacks, Native Americans, and Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders. We have more data on this for Blacks, but the pattern for the other two groups is very similar have much worse health than the US does. So that all the data we talked about initially of the poor health, then for these groups, they do much worse. On the other hand, immigrants tend to have a pattern of health that is better than the US average and better than the native born of their groups. So for example, if you look at readily available national data for the United States, overall death rates or infant mortality, Immigrants of all racial groups have better health than their native-born counterparts. White immigrants have better health than whites born in the U.S. Black immigrants have better health than blacks born in the U.S. Asian immigrants have better health than Asians born in the U.S. Latino immigrants have better health than Latinos born in the U.S. Across the board, there's a healthy immigrant effect. That's the good news. The bad news is, the longer immigrants stay in the United States, the worse their health becomes. So we, have, we see rapid declines in the health of immigrants with increasing length of stay in the United States. I'll give you one example from some of my own work. I've been working on a large project representative of the city of Chicago that's about a third white, a third African American, a third Latino. Almost every health outcome and every risk factor for health we look at, whites have the best, blacks have the worst, Latinos are intermediate. If we simply break out the Latino population by US born or foreign born, on every health outcome we have looked at so far, the foreign-born Latinos look like whites, and U.S.-born Latinos look like African Americans. And you miss that completely just by grouping the two Latino groups together. But there's dramatic divergence just by looking at where were you born. Um, and, and I think when we look at overall Latino data, we often miss the pattern. So for example, this is national data for the United States on infant mortality, the chance that a baby is going to die before their first birthday. And this is my point about the Latino population, this is all Hispanics. If we had looked at Hispanics by nativity, which we don't routinely report, you would see that US-born Hispanics are doing a lot worse than the foreign-born Hispanics, even though the foreign-born Hispanics are poorer. Um, but this is infant mortality in the United States 2012, a very widely used measure of health, and it gives you a sense of African Americans doing much worse, and um, Native Americans as well. Um, with the groups heavily made up of immigrants having a, a pretty good profile, uh, very similar to that of the, of the white um, population. One of the points I want you to realize, and I don't have time to elaborate on this at length, um, or to give you multiple examples, but if you look at race ethnicity around the world, the US pattern is not unique. In virtually every other country where we have data by race, the patterns in the United States are similar to the patterns elsewhere. So I'll give you one example in passing. Infant mortality in the United Kingdom by race ethnicity. And here is a level of, of whites. This is the British whites. This is the white other, which is mainly recent white immigrants from predominantly Eastern Europe. And so you see, again, the immigrants are doing better than whites in general. Um, and some of the historically disadvantaged groups, blacks from Africa, blacks from the Caribbean, and Pakistanis, doing a lot worse with Indians, um, a recently highly educated group, um, doing relatively uh, much better. So if I had data, I, which I have, data from Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, the pattern is, is very similar, South Africa, um, everywhere you look at. Not only do minorities have worse health, but we also have a pattern in US data, and I'll give you one example to illustrate it, that minorities get sick at younger ages have more severe illness and die sooner than whites. Researchers are using several terms to characterize this pattern. Some researchers call it accelerated aging. Some call it premature aging. Arlene Geronimus calls it weathering. And her idea of weathering, imagine a drop of water falling from the rooftop of this building to the concrete sidewalk below. If a water dropped today, there'd be no problem. But if there's a constant drip drip, drip of water, day in, day out, week in, week out, the sidewalk below would become eroded. It would become weathered because of the constant exposure to adversity. Arlen Geronimus argues that for minorities in the United States, your age is not only capturing how long you have lived, 
It's also capturing how long you have been exposed to bad environmental conditions, and therefore how much you have been physiologically compromised and how much you have been weathered because of the exposures to bad environmental conditions. And there's a lot of evidence of this. I'll give you one example. There is enormous interest among health researchers today in looking at telomere length. Telomeres um, are, are, are sequences of DNA at the end of the cro chromosome, so it's looking at the level of every cell of your body. And the way this, the, the oversimplified way to think of telomere length, imagine you have on a pair of running shoes, and the shoelaces are held together with some little plastic at the end. That's what telomeres do at the level of every cell. But the length of the telomere is a very good marker of how physiologically aged you are. So it's a marker of your actual biological age as opposed to your chronological age. And using this marker of biological aging, um, this study documented looking at African American and white women who were all middle aged, so they were the same age chronologically but based on their telomere length, a measure of how biologically aged they were, on average, African Americans were seven and a half years older than their white counterparts. So they had accelerated aging profile of seven and a half years. And there's lots of other data, and if we want in discussion, we can come up with lots of other data. There's overwhelming evidence that this pattern exists, um, and, and it's quite striking. We also have the pattern of the persistence of racial disparities in health. Here is an example, life expectancy at birth from 1950 to 2010, we only have data on blacks and whites over time. There's really good news in the, this data that we want to celebrate, and that is, in, on average, in 1950, whites lived about eight years longer than African Americans. In 2010, there's a four-year gap, so we've reduced the racial gap in health by half. And so we want to celebrate the progress. The other piece of good news in these data is that we see a steady increases in life expectancy for whites and blacks over time. So we're heading, trending in the right direction overall. That is also good news that must be celebrated. At the same time, a four-year gap in life expectancy is quite large. If we froze the life expectancy of whites and had a life expectancy of African Americans increase at an average rate at which life expectancy has increased nationally in the last 10 years, it would take 30 years to close the four-year gap in life expectancy. In fact, you can see those patterns in the data. Look at the life expectancy of whites at birth in 1950, 69.1 years. And let's ask how long did it take for African Americans to catch up to the health that whites had in 1950. It was not until 1990, 40 years later, that blacks had the health that whites had in 1950. So the data has good news for us, but also says we still face major challenges in making um, uh, progress. When I started my career some 30 years ago, most researchers believed that racial differences in health was simply a function of racial differences in socioeconomic status. It made sense. There are large racial differences in socioeconomic status, there are racial differences in health, the differences in income and education drive the differences in health. We now know that life is more complicated. Racial differences in income and education play a role, but the pattern is much more complex. So let me illustrate this with national data for the United States on life expectancy at age 25. At age 25, how long will the average America live? There's a five-year gap. The average white person at age 25 will live five years longer than the average African American. However, within each group, within whites, the difference in life expectancy between whites who have not finished high school and whites with a college degree or more education is 6.4 years, larger than the black-white gap. And this is a profound point. This is not true only about life expectancy. It's true about virtually every health outcome in the United States. That although when we think of equity, we focus on race, the socioeconomic gaps in health in the United States are generally larger than the racial gaps in health. But for 100 years, our federal statistics routinely reports data by race, seldom by socioeconomic status. We, we had to do and go and calculate these data ourselves. This is not reported that way. I can readily get data on race. You do, we don't report data by socioeconomic status, but the socioeconomic status gaps 
in health are larger. So if we look within whites, again, the difference between African Americans with low levels of education and African Americans with high levels of education is 5.3 years bigger than the five-year black white gap. But at the same time, at every level of education, there's a persistence of a race effect. So white high school dropouts of age 25 still live 3.1 years longer than black high school dropouts, and the difference is even larger among the college graduates. And arguably one of the more stunning statistics I will show you today, and this is, remember, national data for the United States, is that the best of African Americans, African Americans with a college degree or more education, they have the highest level of life expectancy for blacks, their life expectancy is still lower than that of whites who have graduated from high school. So these data tell us something very profound. There's something, and by the way, I showed you education in the interest of time. The income data, I have papers that publish the income data, it's exactly the same. Not identical, but it's exactly the same patterns exist. So what these data tell us, there is something profound about economic status, about income and education that drives health in the United States and around the world. But also there's something else about race, ethnicity that also matters for health even after you, you have taken socioeconomic status, income and education into account. What could it be? This research suggests there are four reasons that contribute to this effect of race even after we've taken income education into account. Number one, your health is affected not only by your current circumstances, but by what you've been exposed to over your entire life course. So let's think of the college-educated blacks and whites, for example. College-educated African Americans are more likely to be first-generation college-educated, are more likely to have been born poor, are more likely to have been born low birth weight, are more likely to experience deficits in access to medical care, deficits in nutrition, higher levels of stress and adversity early in life. All your body keeps a record of everything you've experienced. And so at any given moment in, your, in life, your health is not a function of where you stand, but it's a function of what you've been exposed to over your entire life course. And we have an amazing body of evidence that now documents that. There's research now, both from the earliest data came from Scandinavia, but now there's data from the United States that also shows the pattern is true here, is that what is not just what happens to you during your lifetime, it's not only what happens to you during while you were in a baby in your mother's womb that matters, but we now have the phenomenon we are calling preconception stress. What happens in the life of your mother, the year before she became pregnant with you, affects your health in early life as well as over your entire life course. So for example, there's a 50% increase in infant mortality among mothers who had high levels of stress the year before they became pregnant. So we, we are now seeing cross-generational effects and even these preconception effects of what affects our health at a given moment in time. So the life course is really important. You have to look at what happens to you over your entire life. Secondly, all of the indicators of socioeconomic status are not equivalent across race. What do we mean by that? Well, in national data for the US, blacks and Hispanics receive less income at the same levels of education. So if you look at people at the same level of education, Education doesn't buy the same amount of income, so you're not you're looking at apples and oranges. And they have less wealth at equivalent levels of income. So if you only look at income, again, there's racial differences in wealth at every level of income. And the third example is probably the most dramatic example of how life is not fit. Disproportionately, African Americans and Latinos live in more disadvantaged neighborhoods. Do you know what research has shown consistently by economists? That the poor pay more for goods and services in the United States even though the quality of goods and services are inferior in disadvantaged neighborhoods, they're more expensive. Everything is more expensive. Groceries are more expensive, insurance is more expensive, gas is more expensive, price per square foot in disadvantaged inner cities is more expensive than price per square foot of rent in, in a suburban community. So they, 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 it's the, 
they, they have higher cost of goods and services because the dollar doesn't stretch as far in the hands of minorities. So that's a non-equivalence of income. And then experiences of discrimination and racism, and I'll give you a couple of examples, also matter for health in profound ways, and this is a relatively new area of research, as new as in the last 20 years, and I'll give you a quick examples of that. And then minorities not only experience higher levels of stress, but some of my work and the work of others show they have greater clustering of stressors. And that is if you have one, you're more likely to have multiple other stressors. It's not just the individual stressors that are higher, but the clustering of stressors is greater. Let me give an example of the difference between individual and institutional racism um, and to illustrate some of the work we have. Uh, I'll talk about the difference and then I'll give you examples of how these things matter for him. Here is a study, I was actually in um, Portland, Oregon on Sunday of this week. Um, here's a study done by researchers at Portland State University. They ask a simple question. When black and white people stand at a crosswalk to cross the street, does your race determine how long you have to wait to cross the street? So they took three black men and three white men, dressed them identically, and put them at crosswalks in the great city of Portland, uh, randomly assigned, moving them at different points of time so that they were completely counterbalanced in terms of exposure and opportunities. And what they found, that multiple cars were twice as likely to pass a black pedestrian waiting to cross the street, and that on average, blacks had to wait 32% longer to cross the street. This is an example of the persistence of discrimination in American society. These kinds of audit studies where you hold everything identical and the only thing you vary the race have been done in employment, in housing, in a lot of different areas, and they find discrimination does not occur in every single instance, but there's a disproportionate trend of discrimination occurring. Importantly, that's individual discrimination. We're looking at what the behavior of individual drivers did. Here is an example of institutional discrimination from the Cooperative Congressional Election Study in 2012. In the 2012 presidential elections, African Americans across the United States, on average, waited about twice as long to vote as whites did. You can see Latinos waited 19 minutes, Asians 15 minutes, Native Americans 13 minutes, whites 12 minutes. There was no individual discrimination here. This did not reflect the behavior of any precinct worker. In fact, what it reflected was powerfully where you voted, the place, and what were the resources, financial, administrative resources, available to staff precincts in different parts of the United States. And so it really had to do with how much money had been allocated, how many residents were served by a local precinct, how much staff was available by the precinct. My point is, it was all institutional processes and mechanisms reflecting nothing to do with the individual workers who were there, and that's what we call institutional discrimination. It's built into normal processes so that even the people who were at those precincts did not discriminate and had no, no, no mal intent there was nonetheless, as I showed you, systematically racial differences in how long people <coughs> waited to vote. So let's talk about individual discrimination and institutional discrimination and how it can have consequences for health. One of the most powerful mechanisms of institutional discrimination in the United States is one that no one in public policy circles is talking about is residential segregation by race, as well as the forced removal and relocation of native people. <coughs> now, I wrote a paper in 2001 where I said that residential segregation by race was a fundamental cause of racial disparities in health. I was not the first. It was not a brilliant idea I came up with. Myrtle said it in 1944. Uh, the current commission said it in 1968. John Sell was a historian at Duke University. He wrote a book about the origins of segregation in the US South and South Africa. He showed that the framers of apartheid in South Africa looked across the Atlantic and saw segregation implemented in the late 19th and early 20th century in the United States. And they said, brilliant, we love it. And that's where they got the idea from to implement apartheid in South Africa from residential segregation in the US. And he importantly said that residential segregation in the US was one of the single most successful domestic policies of the 20th century. Because it's beneath the radar screen, but it has pervasive, powerful effects. And you're saying, but wait a minute. 
What does place and segregation have to do with health? Well, public health researchers today clearly state that the evidence in the United States indicates that your zip code is a stronger predictor of how long and how well you live than your genetic code. Why do they say that? Because in the US, on average, where you live determines where you go to school and the quality of education you receive. Where you live determines your access to job opportunities. It determines the quality of neighborhood environments and housing, the quality of access to safe places to exercise or access to fresh fruits and vegetables and nearby nature, the quality of exposure to chemical and toxic substances, the access to even high quality medical care is linked to place, the quality of social cohesion and the quality of city services. So virtually every good desirable resource varies by place in the United States. I served as a staff director for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's Commission to Build a Healthy America. And one of the things we did to make this vivid, we created maps with uh, Steve Wolf from Virginia Commonwealth University, created maps for the commission that looked at how life expectancy varies dramatically for different cities simply by which neighborhood you live in. So here is the map. There are multiple cities. You can go to Steve Wolf's website. There are multiple other cities. But here is the greater New Orleans area. And you can see in New Orleans, there is as much as a 25 year difference in life expectancy for people who live in this neighborhood compared to those who live in this neighborhood. And differences of life expectancy of 20 years or more is evident in many cities in the United States, simply linked to where you are located and the power of place in determining access to the opportunities to be healthy. How big a problem is this? Two of America's most eminent sociologists, William Julius Wilson and Robert Sampson, studied 171 largest cities in the United States and said there's not even one city where whites live in equal conditions to those of blacks. And they strikingly said that the worst urban context in which whites reside is considerably better than the average context of black communities because that's what segregation has produced in America. How powerful is this? Why are there racial differences in socioeconomic status? Because of segregation. David Cutler, until recently the Dean of the Social Sciences at Harvard University, one of America's most eminent economists, did a study looking at a national cohort of blacks and whites and using fancy econometric models I cannot even fully describe, he's able to isolate statistically what's the impact of segregation on outcomes in the United States and he concludes that if you could eliminate statistically residential segregation in America, you would completely erase, completely eliminate black-white differences in income, education, and unemployment, and reduce black-white differences in single motherhood by two-thirds. All of that driven by the opportunities linked to place in America. Importantly, what this means it's the large racial ethnic differences in socioeconomic status that we see are not random events. They're not acts of God. It didn't just happen. They didn't come out of thin air. They actually reflect the successful implementation of social policy. They actually reflect that in the United States, we have a rigged system that systematically disadvantages some as well as advantages others. <coughs> So I've talked about the powerful ways in which institutional discrimination can affect health. Let's talk about the ways and the research on the ways in which individual discrimination can also affect health. So it, it was mentioned in the introduction that I developed three measures to capture discrimination. I'll just talk about one of them today, the everyday discrimination scale. Um, it captures only one aspect of discrimination, the day-to-day -day little things that happen like being treated with less courtesy than others and being treated with less respect than others and receiving poorer service than others. I ask the question generically. We don't ask them if these things have happened to you because of your race or your gender, or your sexual orientation or your religion or your income level or your social class or anything. We just ask them, has this happened? And after they've told us, people who said they've had these events, then we can ask them why they happened. We can ask these questions of everyone. One of the things I want to illustrate and by the way, every group in the United States reports everyday discrimination. Whites report everyday discrimination as well. At lower levels than minorities do, 
And the people report discrimination because of race, but they also report everyday discrimination because of gender, or because of sexual orientation, or because of their weight, um, for example. So we, we, we capture all types of discrimination and can look at the effects of different specific types. And what we have found to date in the research, it doesn't matter the reason you report discrimination. So whether you report the discrimination is due to your weight, or is due to the fact that you were treated unfairly because the other person that got the advantage was related to the boss, it doesn't matter what the reason is, whether it's nepotism or whatever, the effects on health are identical. Um, and that is, the perception of unfair treatment is linked to poor health. And to illustrate just how powerful and stunning some of these findings are, I'm going to draw on work by Dr. Tenny Lewis. Tenny Lewis was a researcher at Yale University. When she did these studies, every line in the study is a separate pub, uh, peer-reviewed published paper. Um, in all of these studies, she's looking at the exposure is everyday discrimination and looking at a different health outcome. So in one paper, she found that higher levels of everyday discrimination predicts following people over time and measuring the development of coronary artery calcification, which is a subclinical indicator of heart disease, predicts higher coronary artery calcification, so more rapid development of heart disease followed over time. In another study, higher levels of discrimination predicts higher levels of inflammation as measured by C-reactive protein, and higher levels of inflammation puts you at risk for a broad range of chronic conditions, predicts higher levels of systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Among pregnant women who report everyday discrimination, they give birth to lower birth weight infants, and the lower birth weight infant is at higher risk for childhood disease and adult illness. A study of the elderly followed over time, discrimination predicts more rapid declines in cognitive function over time. A study of community <coughs> residents, higher levels of discrimination predicts poorer sleep, both their self-report of sleep as well as measuring their sleep by actigraphy. A study of adults followed over time, discrimination is an independent predictor of premature mortality. It's literally killing people prematurely. A study of African American and white women um, looking at the relationship between discrimination and abdominal fat they use imaging data to separate abdominal fat into two types. There is subcutaneous fat, the fat just under your skin, that is not that important as a risk factor for disease. And then there's visceral fat, the deep fat in between your body organs. And they found that everyday discrimination was not related to subcutaneous fat, but it predicted among both black and white women, high levels of everyday discrimination predicts high levels of visceral fat. So just this slide tells you, just for one measure of discrimination, the discrimination is a powerful predictor of ill health. By the way, this is not a surprise. I've been studying stress and health before I started to study discrimination. And we know that stress is bad for your health. And all we have demonstrated that discrimination is one type of stressful life experience that, like other stressors, has negative consequences for health. There is their relationship between stress levels and overall mortality in the United States. So this pattern is just certifying that discrimination is a bona fide stress like other types of major stressful life experiences. I also want to illustrate just how powerful some of the effects of discrimination are and how early we find them in life. This is a study done by Gene Brody and his colleagues uh, um, in, in Georgia. Uh, they have been following a cohort of African American teenagers measured their discrimination levels at age 16, 17, and 18. And by age 20, they measured their stress hormones, took blood samples and overnight urine samples, and measured their epinephrine, norepinephrine, uh, cortisol levels, systolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, inflammation, and BMI. And consistently high levels of discrimination in the teens predicts biological dysregulation at age 20. So the effects of discrimination not being evident at age 40, but even at age 20, we can document the negative effects of discrimination on physiological functioning. What can we do about all of these challenges? Number one, we need to give more systematic attention to addressing mental health challenges in the United States population. 
Um, we talked earlier about the mental health challenges faced by a subset of whites with lower levels of education who have not done well economically in recent years, and those mental health challenges have led to dramatic increases in mortality. We are learning more generally, the World Health Organization indicates, that the number one cause of work disability days, the number one reason why people miss work in the world, or why people go to work and don't work at their full capacity, is because of depression and other mental health challenges. So mental health is really important to address. Research reveals that this depression is more disabling than heart disease, arthritis, asthma, and diabetes. So it's not just in their head, that's the way we sometimes think about it, it's just in your head. No, it really matters physiologically, and it really matters for functioning. What we are also finding are very high levels of comorbidity between depression and chronic illnesses. Another way of saying that, a lot of people who have hypertension and diabetes and heart disease and cancer also have high levels of depression. And what the research is finding is if we can assess, diagnose, and treat the depression, we improve their ability to manage their chronic illness. So as we look to the future, we have to pay much more attention than we historically have to mental health and assessing the mental health challenges people face and dealing with them. Second, we also need to provide high quality care to every client. Now somebody says, did you fly all the way here from Boston to tell me that we need to provide high quality care to everybody? That's a no brainer, everybody knows that. That's true, everybody knows it, but we're not doing very well at doing it. It is actually very, very hard to do. So back in 1999, Kevin Schulman, a researcher in Washington, D.C., went to a conference of internal medicine physicians and had 700 of them look at a videotape. And in the videotape, they saw actors. Some were black, some were white, some were male, some were female. But they all described symptoms with identical words, identical facial expression. But what the research found, Kevin Schulman found, was that systematically, African Americans compared to whites and women compared to men got poorer care. They were less, physicians were less likely with the presentation of identical symptoms were less likely to provide the appropriate medical care for the patients. And so Congress, in its wisdom, <laughs> voted to ask the Institute of Medicine to conduct a study. Did what happen at a medical convention with fake patients actually happens when real patients go into healthcare context in the United States? And so the Institute of Medicine commissioned a panel of, of some 12 or 14 of us back in 1999. Um, and we, were, we don't do research, original research. We review the evidence. We found almost 200 papers that had addressed this question in the medical literature. And 80% of them documented that across virtually every therapeutic intervention, from the most simple, and a simple one would be, a patient with a TIA, a mild stroke, shows up into the emergency room, is the patient going to get aspirin or not? If you're black, you're less likely to get aspirin to the most complicated medical procedures, blacks and other minorities receive poorer quality care than whites do. Let me give you one example. Dr. Todd was an emergency room physician at UCLA. He asked a simple question. When a patient comes into the UCLA emergency department with a long bone fracture, that's a broken bone in the arm or leg, does the patient's ethnicity determine whether the patient gets pain medication? You get a picture? A patient with a broken bone does your ethnicity determine when you got pain medication? When you looked at all persons treated by UCLA in the prior year, 55% of Hispanic patients with a broken bone did not get any pain medication, compared to 26% of whites. Dr. Todd was a good researcher. He said, confound it. It's something else. So statistically, he adjusted for the language the patient spoke, whether they got injured on the job or not, how long they spent in the ER, what time they showed up at the ER? How severe was the fracture? Were they hospitalized or not? 
And after statistically adjusting for everything, the single strongest predictor of a patient getting pain medication was the patient being Latino. Dr. Todd moved from UCLA to Emory University in Atlanta, repeated the same study in three emergency rooms in Atlanta, looking at black and white patients and found exactly the same thing. A black patient with a broken bone in the arm or leg shows up at an emergency room in Atlanta, is less likely to get pain medication compared to a white patient. How on earth do we make sense of this? How is it possible that in a country with the best trained medical workforce and healthcare providers who wake up every day to do their best for their patients can nonetheless produce a pattern of care that's discriminatory. And by the way, don't focus on pain medication. This has been documented in every area of medicine. Most of the studies, there were more studies in the area of heart disease treatment than any other area, so it's across every area of treatment. So don't, it's nothing specific about pain, I just use it as an illustration. How do we make sense of this? One of the conclusions we came to and at the time, we had less evidence for this than we have today. Is this phenomenon that social psychologists have been studying for 30 years? It's called implicit bias, it's called unconscious discrimination, it's called unthinking discrimination. And what the research shows is that if you hold a negative belief about a group, any group, this is not about race, this is not about white people, this is not about American society, this is about how all people process information. If you hold a negative stereotype about a group and you meet someone from that group, my next two words are important. It's automatic and it's unconscious. You do it without intent. You do it without awareness. And that is, you will treat that person differently. I tell my students that I am a prejudiced person. I am a prejudiced person because I like to think of myself as a normal human being. If you are a normal human being, you're probably prejudiced. It's normal to be prejudiced. Every society has in-groups and out-groups, has groups that are viewed positively and groups that are viewed negatively. This is, the research has been about race in the United States, but this is not just about race. This is about how human beings process information. So when I say you are likely to be prejudiced, I'm not saying you're likely to be racially prejudiced, you like to be prejudiced against some group. You may not be racially prejudiced, but what other stereotypes you have about gay people, about fat people, about old people, about women? We could just go through groups. It's, if you, it's, it's, it's not just about race. It's any group for which deeply embedded in your subconscious you have negative stereotypes. These are normal processes that occur in everyone. Where did these stereotypes come from? A group of researchers, the racial stereotypes, have put together a database of American culture. In this database of about 10 million words, they've put the books, newspaper articles, magazine articles that the average American reads over the entire lifetime. And what they have found is that if you put American culture into a database, you can now ask this database of American culture when the word black appears in American culture, what adjective tends to co-occur with it? Well, the adjective most frequently co-occurring with black is poor, then violent, then religious, then lazy, then cheerful, then dangerous. When white occurs, wealthy, progressive, conventional, stubborn, successful, educated. For the fun of it, when female occurs, distant, warm, gentle, Passive, male, dominant, leader, logical, strong. These coefficients next to it, to interpret them the measures of associated strength similar to simple correlation coefficients. <coughs> so these are the 10 most commonly uh, stereotypes occurring with black and white in this database of American culture. Folks, this has profound implication of some of the challenges we face as a nation right now. What this tells me is that when a police officer sees a young black male and assumes he's more violent and dangerous than he is, we are not necessarily dealing with an inherently bad cop. We are looking at a normal American who is reflecting and acting on what is deeply embedded in his mind 
as a result of the society in which he was raised. Because the processes of implicit bias occur more likely when you are under, when you need to make snap judgments, when you're under pressure, when you have a lot of cognitive information to process. The good news is there's a lot we can do about it. There's research, there's a paper by Diana Burgess that reviews all of the strategies that have been shown what works to reduce implicit bias. And I usually talk to people about the divine solution. Professor Patricia Devine at the University of Wisconsin have put many of these strategies together into a single program and finds that it is effective in reducing implicit and explicit bias and the effect is sustained over time. If you want to see how you do on implicit bias, the implicit association test available on the implicit.harvard.edu implicit test um, exists and you can do it. Uh, I would warn you, um, Dr. Anthony Greenwald, who developed the test, because this is his area of research and he was concerned about it, when he took the test for the first time, discovered that he had anti-black bias. Professor Banaji, who manages the website that runs the test, when she took for the test for the first time, discovered that she had anti-black bias. What percentage of Americans have anti-black bias? At least 70% in studies that have been done of millions of Americans. The only exception to that 70% number is African Americans. What percentage of African Americans have implicit bias? At least 30%. So one in three blacks have implicit bias because having implicit bias against blacks is not about your skin color, it's what's in your mind. And they raise your product of American society, these things matter. Let me hurry quickly so I can leave some time for discussion. What else do we need to do to improve America's health? We need care that addresses the social context. The World Health Organization asks the question, what do we accomplish if all we do is treat illness and send people back to live in the same conditions that made them sick in the first place. So we need to think of a much more comprehensive model of how we try to address some of the underlying challenges that people face. It means we now need to be asking what are not only the medical needs that our patients have, but what are their non-medical needs that they have. And how can we connect them to social services that will help them to manage their lives, which will help them to improve the care they can provide uh, for themselves. Two examples of this. The Medical Legal Partnership born at the Boston Medical Center. If you are a primary care provider at the Boston Medical Center, that's a safety net hospital in the greater Boston area, can refer a patient to a number of specialists. One of the specialists the primary care provider can refer to is a lawyer. The hospital has on-site attorneys to solve the problems in the lives of their patients. Why? Because a child with asthma, and if the asthma is secondary to the poor housing conditions, all the asthma medication in the world you give that child will not cure that child of asthma if the child goes back to live in the same housing conditions that made them sick in the first place. And the mother who has talked repeatedly to the landlord and gets no action does get action when a lawyer calls and says, we will sue you because you're violating the housing code of the state of Massachusetts, and if you don't fix the problem, we will sue you. So they have brought lawyers together, and in 200 hospitals across the country, the medical legal partnership is so big now, they actually even hold an annual conference, it is broadening the way in which we treat patients. Another example is Health Leads. Health Leads is similar to the medical legal partnership, except that Health Leads uses undergraduate students. I teach an undergraduate class at Harvard, and I have some of my students volunteer for Health Leads. They go and staff hospital admissions desks, and they assess patients, the challenges, this is the health lease checklist, whether people have problems with food, with homelessness, with utility bills, with job training, and it's the job of the student who identifies that problem, they're well trained, to fix it, to identify a resource that exists out there and link that family member who needs it to that particular program. There are other examples across the country in Oregon where the Medicaid office is working with social service providers to comprehensively address the needs that the patients have. Or in Minneapolis where the Hennepin County um, Accountable Care Organization is combining county provided social services with the provision of Medicaid. But we also need to move further upstream we need to address some of the non-medical determinants of health. Let me give you a dramatic example that comes from Chapel Hill, North Carolina. 
the Abbasidarian project. The Abbasidarian project took four kids, birth through five. So at birth, they are randomly assigned to a high quality early childhood development center where they get good nutrition, medical care, a nurturing, intellectually stimulating environment. What they find by age 30, all you did was birth through five, by age 30, those who got the program compared to the control group who didn't get it, lower levels of risk of multiple indicators of heart disease. Here is one example. This is the systolic blood pressure levels at in the mid-30s of people who got the program, and this is a control group who live in the same neighborhood who didn't get it. So we're seeing dramatic differences in health in adulthood linked to how we take care of our kids, birth through five. We also need to improve economic well-being. I'm not going to give you the data on this in the interest of time, but in the last 60 years, the black-white gap in health has narrowed or widened with the black-white gap in income. When the black-white gap in income narrowed, like between 1968 and 1978, the black-white gap in health narrowed. When the black-white gap in health widened during the 1980s, the black-white gap in health widened. So we can look nationally at what happens with the income gap and see what happens with the overall health gap. I have data on it, but in the interest of time, I'm going to go on. We also need to improve neighborhood and housing conditions. Um, I want to give you the examples of two quick studies. One, the move into opportunity. Move into opportunity was a project that went to public housing um, uh, projects and randomly took some people by the flip of a coin and gave them a voucher so they could move to better housing quality. It was not a health intervention. All it did was change the neighborhood. 10 to 15 years later, people who had been moved, lower levels of obesity, lower levels of severe obesity, lower diabetes risk, linked simply to just changing the neighborhood environment. But let me give you an even more stunning example. Purpose-built communities started out in East Lake Atlanta. And what purpose-built model is, we will address all of the challenges that disadvantaged communities face simultaneously. We will not try to address one problem here and one problem there, but all of them together. So come with me to East Lake Meadows in Atlanta, 1995. This public housing project had a $35 million a year drug trade. 90% of the families who lived there were victims of a felony every year. Public housing. Only 13% of the adults were employed. It was one of the worst performing schools in the state of Georgia with only 5% of students performing at grade level. Come with me to East Lake Meadows in today. I visited this community, um, this um, housing remarkable development um, last year. There's been a 73% reduction in crime, a 90% reduction in violent crime, high quality, mixed income housing, all able-bodied persons are employed, the schools are among the best performing in the entire state of Georgia. They have a cradle to college pipeline, they have dramatically improved every indicator of economic performance and therefore of health, and it shows that we know what to do, we can do it, it's possible. By the way, Purpose-built communities is providing free technical assistance to any community who wants to implement their model. So, one of the things we need to do in improving health is to discover strategies that will improve the health of the disadvantaged more rapidly than the rest of the population. I'll give you one quick example to make that point. If you look at smoking levels in the United States, the good news is we have dramatically reduced smoking levels. We've cut smoking levels by half from 1970 to 2010. The bad news is, if we look at what has happened with trends in smoking by education, the gaps in cigarette smoking, which did not exist in 1960, this is different levels of education, have e exist today. What I mean by that is, in the last 30, 40 years, persons of higher levels of education have dropped their smoking rates much bigger than persons of low level of education. So there's a big gap today where there was a very small gap in 1950, in 1960. What, what that illustrates is possible to improve health of all even while you widen the gap. 
So we need to think of strategies that, that addresses the problem. What's holding us back? Why aren't we doing more of this? I think our single biggest problem is the lack of political will. I I've given you examples of high quality scientific evidence that shows us what to do and shows us it works. We know what to do. The question is, we don't have political will. Let me give you one example of where we don't have political will. The child poverty rate in the United States, this is from the UNICEF, is 34. We rank 34th in the world in terms of child poverty rate. That is not inevitable. If you look at other countries, Ireland, the child poverty rate in Ireland is 8%, but before taxes and transfers, it was 42%. It means the economic system in Ireland produced a child poverty rate of 42%. Taxes and transfers refers to choices the society made, and Ireland has put a safety net in place that reduces the gap, the level, from 42% to 8%. In the US, we reduce it from 24% to 23%. It's the choices we are making as a society of what we are doing to support our kids. This is a wonderful resource, The Raising of America. If you haven't seen it, you should. It's a resource on early childhood development and what we can do. One of the things we also need to do in building political will is to eliminate what researchers are calling the empathy gap. What do we mean by the empathy gap? It means that we don't emotionally connect with the challenges that poor people and minorities face. W.E.B. Du Bois spoke about this back in 1899. In a chapter in his book on Negro health, he said the most difficult social problem in the matter of Negro health is the peculiar attitude of the nation toward the well-being of the race. And Du Bois continued, there have been few other great cases in the history of civilized peoples where human suffering has been viewed with such peculiar indifference. So one of our challenges is, how do we tell the story of the challenges that, that disadvantaged people face in a way that connects emotionally with the problems of people? I leave you with two quotations. Dr. Martin Luther King said, true compassion is more than flinging a coin to a beggar. It understands that an edifice which produces beggars needs restructuring. There are many edifices that are producing the inequalities that exist, and we need to restructure them. And finally, I leave you with the words of Robert F. Kennedy. Each time a man or woman stands up for an ideal, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And those ripples can build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. It is my hope that each of you, in your own sphere of influence, decides to be a tiny ripple of hope. And together, we can address inequities and improve health and outcomes for every child born in this country. Thank you very much. Dr. Williams will take some questions. So. Any questions or comments? Yes. Um, I just, I'm just asking for your comments on this. But I heard NIH podcasts that actually looking at a cohort that, that what used to be some college like back in the 60s or 50s, that now that, that was a good indicator, but that in the current sort of cohort from the century, some college often means somebody had to drop out of college, and that's kind of relevant to all of us, and that it's become more of a negative indicator instead of a positive indicator. But that's a cohort effect. Do you, are you familiar with that? Yes, but I, I wouldn't say it's a negative indicator. It means it doesn't buy as much in terms of improved health as it used to. So we, can, we don't even have to look at college. We can think of, of high school completion. High school completion in the 1940s meant a lot more than it means today. Because the cohort and what has happened to other people around us has changed. So you're absolutely right. The meaning and therefore the health impact of particularly certain levels of economic status are, are not doing as much now as they may have done in earlier cohorts. So that's right. But we still have 
in earlier times and today, we still have the same stratification, that high levels of education and income. Um, but it, it does mean that the levels of education that would buy what maybe a high school completion board you know, 40 years ago, it will take a college degree to buy a, a comparable level if you, if you try to standardize them in that way. So yes, there, there is some truth to that. Any other questions or comments? Yes? Uh, could you explain a little more how the changes happened in Atlanta, that project? You know, what was done that so many changes happened in, in just 20 years? It's amazing. So what exactly took place there? Okay, that, that's good. The, the purpose-built model is a, a model that involves community engagement. So they had a community, and there were some women, primarily, who lived in that public housing project, who were willing to work with others to say what would our future look like, and to help set the rules and how this would function. So community engagement was one piece. What they also had was involvement of the Atlanta Public Housing Department, the person who currently is a CEO of, of Purpose Built Communities as an organization, started out as a lawyer working for the Atlanta Public Housing Project when the project be began. So it, it was government involvement, and they had private investment. There was a, a wealthy developer who had driven through the neighborhood and was stunned by what he saw and felt this was unacceptable in the United States, and he brought financial resources. So their model involves bringing community economic resources with community involvement, with the government together to work um, uh, in a concerted way to develop policies and improve it. Their vision is a cradle to college pipeline. They have a high quality um, early childhood education center that is part of a new um, Y that they've built right next to the housing project. Um, their model is to have high quality housing, 50% of the units are market rate, 50% of the units are persons who still qualify um, for, for public housing vouchers. But one of the policies that was implemented um, by the residents is that everyone who lives there has to work. You don't have to be working to apply, but you have to have a commitment to work in order to, to live there. And they provide resources to help individuals find a job. They donated the land for a supermarket to open right next door, so you have access to a supermarket. And the other point I would say in spending a day with them is that they are completely committed to high quality. So for example, Everyone who works in the early childhood development program has to have a master's degree. And they interview, they have two teachers interview any potential teachers for the high school or elementary school. And they are, they are bringing in high quality educational expertise. So I'll give you an example. There is a, a, a purpose-built site uh, being developed in Omaha, Nebraska right now. The principal for the school in Omaha, Nebraska, and this is just getting off the ground, so it's maybe a year before the school really reopens. He is spending a week a month in Atlanta being trained to be an effective principal. And he's doing that for a year. And they're paying for him to come for a year to get trained to be. So they're, they're focused on high quality and they're working with educational consultants. I was amazed at what the elementary school kids were doing in terms of science and so on. So it's, it's a complete commitment to high quality. And I said that their school, the elementary school, is one of the top three in all the last few years, is either one of the top three performing schools in Georgia. 60% of the students at the school still qualify for reduced price lunches. So these are not wealthy kids. It shows that we know what to do. Where there's a will, there's a way. If we have a commitment to improve quality, we can improve quality. That example truly shows that it has to be both ways. It's not only you know the wonderful programs from top down, but the community oh, is going to make the change too. And I have traveled to so many places in the world, and I'm always surprised 
that some very poor neighborhoods in other places of the world have clean streets and they, they still care about you know, keeping everything neat and orderly and making sure that the kids go to school. And, and the poor areas here, they are just the opposite. So I'm just I wouldn't overgeneralize. I, I have traveled a lot in the world too. Okay, and I've seen, I've seen bad poverty in the world too and, and challenges. But you're right. You are absolutely correct. You are absolutely correct. And the role that the church used to play, the role that the church used to play, just in having a certain standard of what is right and wrong, and also the responsibility that every single person has in the world for their own being too. It's just not, you know, that the church is, and the role of the church is diminishing in the whole, uh, 21st century so, in the modern world, but you know we also need to talk about some ethics, ethical standards, values that have to be installed as well. It has to come from from many different levels. I agree with you that any effective community intervention has to involve the voice of the community. The community brings strengths and resources to the table, and projects that a group of external people come and superimpose on a community um, do not work, work well long term. Um, so that engaging the community is important. But I wouldn't put all of the responsibility only on the community. It has to be a joint. But I, I completely agree with you. It has to be a joint effort. And I would also agree with you. There's a new book out by Professor Ellen Eidler um, entitled Religion as a Social Determinant of Health. Um, this is Professor Ellen Eiler from Emory University, and you, historically the role that religious institutions can play and still do play, religious institutions are doing some fantastic work um, even in the area of health disparities and using religious uh, organizations as the basis for, for the development of, of community health programs and using religious motivation as a source of motivation to help people to engage in ways they hadn't engaged before. Um, but I wouldn't say it's only religion. We need to capitalize on all of the resources that exist in our communities and strengths and resilience factors to bring about the changes we need. Just another example. There was another person who wants to ask a question, question Karen. I'm sorry, right. but this gentleman in the back was uh, trying to answer. I think we have to be very careful on blaming the correctly oppressed, um, and that's what we tend to do in this country, is we, are, we blame the oppressed. You know, when, if, if I'm from North Philly, and I don't, and, and, and there's no trash trucks coming in, then yeah, there's going to be a lot of trash in the neighborhood, because no one's, no one cares. There are so many areas, um, rural areas, and areas in our inner city, in which, uh, you know, our government and policy makers forget about. And I think it's very easy to say, why don't they pick up the trash? Well, maybe there is no motivation to pick up the trash because maybe no one cares. No, everyone's forgotten about us. So I, I just think that we have to be very careful about that. So there are two sides to the coin, and we need to acknowledge both. And I'm, I'm with both of you on the points. Both of you have made valid points. I think there was a hand in front, yes. And then um, we take how many more? Two, yep. three? Just a couple. I, I can stay as long, but I, I know we have a program and a reception and I know. Uh, things. We'll take one, uh, one or two more, and then we'll one or two more. reception after yes. that. Um, so from your TED medical that I watched, you gave an example of, I guess, a 75-year-old man who went to Harvard, African-American man. And um, I would say 75 or 65. And the research was basically saying that the court, cohort of the African-American... Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Yes. okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For a minute, she, she threw me. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. I was saying you confused my TED talk with another one. But, but okay, yes, your point is well taken. Um, yes. Okay. Um, so uh, that cohort, they found that a lot of the African-American men were dying at a younger age compared to the other members of their cohort. So even though they gain status in the social economic status, they can't help the discrimination that's put against them since birth and since a young age. What is a way for them to reach the same life expectancy or health status as their counterparts? Okay, let me let me make sure everybody's on the same page. So she's referring to 
very well informed. Uh, there's a TED talk that was released about three weeks ago that I gave last December. Um, and uh, it begins with the story of a very successful African-American male who graduated from Yale um, in the 1970s, went on to a law degree from Columbia and had a distinguished career, but he died uh, prematurely at age 62. What this Yale alumni magazine um, did was looked at all the black people who graduated in the same year and found that the death rate among black Yale graduates was three times higher than that of the average class member, the other class members, the non-black class members. So all that does is personalize the data I showed you. I, I showed you nationally that a black person with a college degree on a, or more education in the United States has shorter life expectancy than a white with a high school completion. What can we do about it was your question. One of the things in the, in the research on the stress and discrimination, um, stress and discrimination has negative effects on health. So let me give you an example of what we know about protective resources. So remember the study I showed you done by Gene Brody in the great in Georgia, where he's finding that, that adolescents who are exposed to discrimination at age 16, 17, 18, by age 20, you can see biological dysregulation. There is no biological dysregulation among adolescents exposed to those levels of discrimination who are in very supportive environments. They report high levels of social support from their parents, their teachers, their friends, and others. So the quality of social relationships in their lives breaks the relationship, or what we use, we use the word buffers. It's a buffering effect. It protects them from the adverse exposures that they have. We have documented in the stress literature in general that the quality of social ties is a powerful predictive health. Let me tell you how powerful it is. Uh, Jim House, um, one of my mentors at Michigan, he studies social ties and its impact on health. And if you look at national data for, in the United States and look at the relationship between cigarette smoking and mortality, it's similar to the relationship between social isolation and mortality. People in America who are socially isolated, who don't have friends, who don't maintain meaningful relationships with others, they have higher death rates. Let me state that differently. Social isolation is as bad for your health as a cigarette smoke. So it, it's, it's, it just illustrates that even in the face of very difficult, stressful experiences, protective resources matter. We also find psychological resources matter. People who have high on optimism matters. And my, my friend here who was making the point would like to know that another resource that matters profoundly is religious involvement. So higher levels of religious involvement um, uh, reduces the negative effects of stress in general and of discrimination on health. Now, however, I think it's wonderful to identify the resources, but I don't think we should stop it. So there are people who are being exposed now, and if we can identify resources that help them, that's great. But we also need to think, what can we do to prevent the occurrence of those experiences in the first place? So what I think is useful to identify the resilience resources and the protective factors, and that's important, and we need to get that word out. We also need to think of what are the strategies we can implement to reduce the stress in, before it occurs, to reduce the occurrence of discrimination in the first place. So I want to uh, thank you all for coming, and, and thank, uh, let's thank uh, Dr. Williams for... Uh,